I'm Dr. Sharifah Mazlina. Uh, my background, I'm a psychologist, I'm, uh, more focusing more on mental toughness. And I'm now currently in Malaysia in uh, a city called Shah Alam in Selangor. My full-time job is being a sports psychologist and also professional motivator. And also at the same time, I'm also a chairman for my own NGO named All Women Empowerment to Accelerate. Or in short, uh, AWETA, A-W-E-T-A, All Women Empowerment to Accelerate. Currently, I'm quite busy handling uh, a lot of activities with my NGO. Like we do a lot of uh, women empowerment for the less fortunate people, uh, especially the young ones, uh, inspiring them. And uh, probably you have heard about me, uh, went to Antarctica recently in 2019 with three young girls. That is basically part of my activities, uh, the most extreme and the most uh, expensive activities that we have done under our NGO. But at the same time, I'm also uh, continuing doing my training or my motivation program uh, via online. Were you always adventurous? Were you always into psychology? Did you know that you'd want to grow up and to, to focus on, you know, motivation and inspiration? I think I am a very outgoing person since I was small, since I was in school. Uh, even in primary school, I was so active in sports. I just love sports very much. When I was 13, I already started to represent my school for inter-school meet. And then uh, I went up to even to represent Malaysia uh, in a sports events like uh, in track and field. And I continue doing that. I trained very hard, even though there's not so much of professional trainer during that time. So, But I find my ways to to excel in my sports career. I was a javelin thrower when I was in school and in the university level. I also play hockey for the country. And uh, I'm, I was also a baseball player. <laughs> I was a heavy batter. I have a very strong arm. And last but not least, uh, I was also involved in Taekwondo. Yeah, very competitive. I was very, very active from my school days. Not only in sports, but also in um, co-curriculum activities. I was a schoolgirl prefect. I was the, the, the president for so many clubs. I, I can never stop. Like I, I am not the person who will not do anything. I would just love to do something. I, I was also considered quite good in my academic, which uh, in my, my secondary school, I, I did well, even though I was very active in sports. That allows me, with my results, that allows me to go to college. And I did my first degree in sports science um, and or physical education, sorry. And then I furthered my study. I went to Canada, to McGill University of Montreal. That's why I pursued my uh, psychology um, so-called career, uh, where I enhance and I developed this formula myself, psychological formula called MAPS concept, or the acronym means called M-E-P-S-S, Mental, Emotional, Physical, Social, and Spiritual Concept, which created a balanced human being. And the spine of this concept is to create someone to change the mindset, number two, to get out from the comfort zone, and number three, the person must be able to maximize the potential. So all this while, <clears throat> I didn't realize that I have created this formula since I was in school. I've been doing that to myself. I've developed this formula. I tested on myself. I've been doing it and I know I can con continue to progress every two, three years. I'll keep on progressing and achieving whatever I have set up because I follow the formula that I have created. I can um, do more with this formula. So when I did my master's in Montreal, uh, in this McGill University when I presented the paper to my professor. So she was so surprised and said, wow, this is a beautiful formula. That it's like a real ideal to create a balanced human being. So uh, she was surprised that I've created it since I was in school. And she said, why don't you do something about it? Try to put it into practical. We want more uh, motivational speaker who speak from true stories. We don't want motivational speaker who just speak from books, from learning process, but we want people to speak 
based on true stories. You must experience yourself with the formula. So that's trigger my interest into venture into more extreme things. So what happened that when I came back to Malaysia after I completed my master's uh, in Montreal, I was involved in the Commonwealth Games as, um, as a mental trainer because in 1998, Malaysia hosting a Commonwealth Games. So I was involved as uh, one of the mental trainers for the national athletes. So I used this formula. And then I joined the universities as, um, as a lecturer. I shared it with my students. They love it. I can see they, they, they transform themselves from ordinary girl, become a school le a, a university leaders. Uh, I can see that so beautifully. So what happened is that finally I was invited by a group of senior professors that they organized this mental training academy based in Sweden and also a mental, con mental training congress in Russia. They invited me, paid for my air ticket and everything. So I went to this World Congress. I presented the paper. Boom, this is where it started, where everybody gets so excited about the formula. And then they said, wow, Sharifa, this is so ideal. We just love it. It's so contemporary. But please do us a favor. Go somewhere extreme with a minimal support. And it's, it's supposed to be very challenging and see how you can use your formula and you must succeed with your, that challenge. So that's the starting point where I started to go to Antarctica. That's how it started way back in 2004 when I went for, uh, 2003 when I went to Antarctica for the first time. I just want to test the formula, but then it become, it become big, bigger and bigger and then uh, it become a national mission. Yep. Oh, fantastic. That's so exciting. So you've had this concept, you've been following your passions, of in, yeah. sp in sports science, in psychology, focusing on, you know, specializing in mental strength and you've developed this concept, but now you've actually got to put it into practice. So yes. let's talk about deciding to head to the South Pole, the expedition that you went on. Talk about, you know, your training and your preparation and what you were going to be doing out there. Going to Antarctica is not like going for a vacation. It's not that easy. So when I first wanted to go to Antarctica, way back in 2003, that was the first one. When I contacted the organization that organized this trip to Antarctica, then they said, okay, Sharifa, remember, it's not easy. You are from Malaysia and your temperature is like 36 Celsius. And here is like minus 36 Celsius and so on. How are you going to cope with it? So they asked me to prepare a report where my physical fitness, my health conditions, and the training that I'm supposed to go through. And also, I have to go through a lot of technical and tactical training, uh, how to survive in Antarctica, like uh, skiing, the camping, the ice survival and all that. It was so difficult for me to adapt and cope with all the requirements. But again, I use my formula. I use my MAPS concept formula that I think, okay, if I can, if I can do this, it's going to be a very good, inspirational tips for those who wants to try to do to get off comfort zone and and maximize their potential and to become somebody from zero to a hero so i got to do it i have to really like walk the talk so i keep on pushing myself so what i did i had to train like five hours a day from the beginning like three hours for cardio and two hours for, for power lifting you know it's, it's not like going to be a bodybuilder. It's not that. But probably still for, to develop the muscle endurance because when you cross Antarctica, when you travel in Antarctica, you need to work like more than 10 to 12 hours a day, like crossing for eight hours or 10 hours. And then you need to have like another spare two hours to set up the tent. If you are lucky, there's no wind, then it's going to be easy. Like one hour, you're going to complete set up, setting up the tent. But if there's storms, there's strong wind and all that, it's going to be more difficult for for me to set up the time. So I need to have extra energy for two hours. My muscles need to be able to work for that two hours to set up the tent, to defrost the things, to defrost the computer, to start cooking, to set up the tent so that I can rest and sleep for the whole night and then start walking and crossing again the next day. So I need to remember that I have to have a lot of energy for that. So that is for fitness itself. And then what uh, I did 
more after that is like pulling tires like it's a simulation of pulling sledge so i pull tires again um if i don't go to the gym then, then i just train outside but normally i start training late evening because i don't want to be under hot sun it's not good because antartica is cold so it's best to be with a cold climate as well so malaysia there is no snow so i will train like without the sun so pulling tires for a few hours also as a simulation also for cardio training and on top of it uh, a lot of mental training by uh, studying looking uh, looking at the videos study uh, or read a lot of information on antarctica on those who have been to antarctica communicate with them get information get advice and all that and then they organize the organization organize me to go to a training center which they set up in uh, norway so i went to norway i went to norway and i was trained there by few trainers which they used to work in antarctica with so many organizations so i trained with them this is where i trained my a uh, cool weather skill like camping uh using all the uh setting up the tent the stove uh, the clothing and everything so once i have all the information and all the training i feel more and more confident that i think yeah i can do it yeah. having a hot climate country doesn't mean that i cannot do this extreme cold weather challenge so yeah i never stop and keep on going so That's why I did in 2003 I went for my pre expedition because there is no enough training so I went in for a pre expedition so I just went at the base camp I was in Petrod Hills that time and then 2004 then I did my actual expedition and it never I never stopped like I just enjoy doing that no doubt I have a lot of uh, a lot of uh, injuries but that doesn't stop me you know but funny thing that when I was in that expedition moment when i had injuries like frostbite and all that i said okay this is that's it i had enough of this enough is enough when i go back to malaysia i just going to enjoy and be like a donary people but it was then when i came back after the injury recovered <laughs> i started to plan for the next trip which is in 2000 2007 i went to north pole and then 2011 i went to greenland and recently i went to antarctica again so yeah i just enjoy doing this So let's go back to your 2004 South Pole expedition. Do you just want to yeah. share a little bit more about the expedition, about the logistics, where you were starting from, where you guided, where you solo and how you got from A to B? What was the route and what were the logistics? Okay, uh in 2004 I was uh, guided and I started the journey from we went in from Punta Arenas straight to the first base camp. And the base camp was at Petrod Hills, and then they flew me up to South Pole, right in the South Pole. That was the starting point. So then I was ski sail out back to near the base camp. The journey was about one thousand one hundred and twenty-seven kilometers in twenty-two days. So I was using ski sail, yeah, from South Pole back to the base camp. Yeah. With your guide, was it a male guide or a female guide that you had? I have so many guys actually. So but but during that time was a, a male guy. Yeah. I was just I just be interested to know more about maybe the the cultural sensitivities around being yeah. a Muslim woman out in Antarctica and and is that impacted at all on um on the challenge? Not at all. It was uh it was like an uh, uh um I can't call it was an issue happens when I first uh doing this in 2003 at that times well social media is not so the in thing yet but uh cyber tv was already started beginning in malaysia so there was one cyber tv in malaysia i forgot the name of the cyber tv so they called me for an interview they said okay we have a lot of comments from all over the world at that time probably the follow up for that cyber tv saying that hey we heard there's there's a muslim woman from malaysia they're going to cross antarctica the remark was like some of it was quite positive some of it like quite skeptical they said why is she like wearing veil and how can she go to cross antarctica so funny so when i appear on the tv then i said look i can answer you very simple regardless if you're male or female when you go into antarctica you definitely going to wear veil all the way even the male you have to cover the whole body <laughs> you're going to wear <laughs> so basically you're covered uh, regardless male or female you need that you have to cover yourself because it's too extreme so 
It's not an issue of wearing a veil. Go to Antarctica, I dress just like any expeditor. Any uh, people who go to Antarctica will dress almost the same. You have to wear the headgear. You have to wear the thick clothing. You have to have full face cover. You have to wear balaclava, goggles and all that. So it's not an issue. It was extreme cold. So you definitely have to cover. So no issue at all. I'm okay with it. Uh, and, and when I explain that, and uh, people understand. They say, yeah, you make sense. Yeah, that's good. That's nice. Got nothing to do with religion and all that. Yep. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit more about your food and your nutrition. What were you eating out there to, um, you know, to maintain your calories in such a, you know, extreme and cold environment? You know, what were your what were your foods? What were you eating? Oh, very interesting. You know, people from Malaysia they love hot and spicy food. So back here in Malaysia, we eat rice a lot. Uh, of course, with vegetables and uh, uh, fruits and all that. But in Antarctica, uh, you can't have that. So, because when you bring anything, any food that pre-cooked and with a lot of gravy, we need more fuel to defrost it. Because it's, you can imagine that minus 50, minus 45. So, everything is frozen. So, the food that requires for Antarctica or any polar expedition is dry freeze, basically pasta-based dry freeze kind of food. You can have a few flavors. Uh, there's so many suppliers from all over the world, from UK, from Norway, from uh, US. They do have this kind of food. You can just choose uh, whatever you like. And the quantity of the food intake for every meal, at least 550 kilocalories per meal. It, it, it's all in the packet. It's nicely done in the packet. So being a Muslim, I have to eat halal food. All right. But... Uh, during that time, and even now, it's very difficult to find this kind of food which is halal. So what I can do, the Islam is is not that rigid. So when it comes to situation which is difficult and you need to survive, so what I can do, I can skip the meat, uh, that meat base, because it's not uh, properly slaughtered and it's not halal. So I, it's okay, I can just skip the meat base. I can still eat the food like pasta base with vegetarian Pasta base with only rice, like uh, mixed rice, so something like that, or, or Thai food kind of flavor. I can still have all that, so it's not an issue. As long as the kilocalorie is 550 kilocalories. If the meal, like vegetarian normally, you won't get up to 550 kilocalories. So I can substitute the balance by having dry fruits, like dates, all kinds of dry fruits that's selling online. Uh, you can get it on, on the shelf at the supermarket. And peanuts, a lot of peanuts. And not forgetting the best part is chocolate. <laughs> a lot of chocolates. I just love the chocolates. Yeah. So that's good enough to substitute uh, the balance of the kilocalories that you need for the for one meal. How did you get on with the cold? You know, especially when you're in that environment for such a long time, even though you are wrapped up, did you get used to it or was it just this almost like this constant struggle to keep warm? The call is no joke. I think even though, even how good you are, even even the guides or even those who've been into Antarctica as, uh, as the organisers, they used to be there. When it comes to the cold, extreme cold, everybody will feel the pain. So, as for me, I just love cold. That's fun, something funny about me. Yes, I was born in Malaysia. It's hot and humid. But I just love cold country. I just love cold weather. Every time I go for traveling, I definitely go during winter. That's the reason why I further study in Montreal. You know, Montreal, when it comes to winter, the temperature can go as low as minus 50. And thick snow. <laughs> so, that's one of the criteria that I choose when I wanted to further my studies. So I, actually, I, I got an offer uh, from a few countries like Australia, US, Canada. Uh, they are all top five universities uh, in the world. But finally, I choose Montreal because of the weather. <laughs> Besides, the university is very good, the top, top five. So being in Antarctica, yes, struggling with the cold climates was killing me. But I need to improvise. I need to modify certain things you you have to you, you cannot just like cry out loud oh it's so cold no, i cannot do that and we cannot do that we, we are well trained to go to antarctica so of course we have 
like five to six layers of different material clothing. This is how you get to get used to it. When, for example, the first two uh, thermal, the thin liners and the thermal, the brinier thermal is good enough when you're not moving around so much. So when you feel all the cold temperature goes into your black bones, you have to wear as much as possible. But the moment I'm moving out for the expedition to do the crossing, I will wear less. So you just play around, uh, play along with the temperature. What you do and what what material you should do. Like if you are sitting static, I will put on the thickest one, which is down jacket. Beside the few layers that I have inside my body, the last one will be the down jacket, the the the, the thickest, fluffy, big jacket. That is to capture all the heat, and you can have the warm in inside it. But when I did my crossing, when I went out from my tent, I start walking. I will wear um, uh, Gore-Tex, which is probably only two or three layers on my body because it's getting warmer and warmer the moment you walk because your body heat start to come out. So you don't want to have uh, wet, uh, damp in the body so that you have to wear something that can have some kind of ventilation so that the breathing of the body heat and the cold weather is going to be neutralized so that you feel very comfortable. That's how we work. We don't simply put all six or seven layers all together all the time, no. Sometimes thinner, sometimes thicker. Yeah. So you've been to the South Pole, the North Pole and Greenland. What's been the biggest challenge that you face while you've been on a polar expedition? To me, the biggest challenge was the extreme cold. And I think comparing North Pole, South Pole and Greenland, I think North Pole was the toughest, the, the, the most challenging because... South Pole is so thick, the ice is so huge, the ice is so thick, like 2.3 kilometers below, you're not too worried about uh, falling into the water, there is no, not so much of that, it's just that the wind, the wind factor is the, the most challenging for South Pole. Uh, strong wind was the main challenge, but for North Pole, beside the wind, you are actually walking on a floating iceberg, so the depth of the water is 14,000 meters below, you are walking on this floating iceberg, which is floating and drifting every single second. So that is also polar bear, which I have to carry my gun. I was, I carried my 9.44. You have to be careful with that. And then um, the thin ice, you have to really uh, focus on where you step on. You can see thin ice a lot, open water, the global warming effect. So uh, it's very stressful in, in North Pole. I was having my first frostbite on my second day on my cheek because it's wet and it's cold. There's water. How did you deal with the frostbite? What do you need to do once you've got it on your on your face? Quickly put a heat pack because you don't. You know, you know, one thing funny about frostbite, you don't feel it. You don't feel the pain when you are out on the ice. You don't feel it because you just feel so comfortable. Because when it's so cold, the frostbite will happen but you don't feel anything because you're so numb. Your face will be so numb or your fingers will be numb. But the moment the numbness will become very painful when you go into the tent, when you get the heat, when you start cooking, this is where you start feel the pain. But how you should do is that you have to bear with the pain to avoid the, the frostbite to become bigger and bigger and get worse. So quickly put hand warmer, hot pack, on top of the first frostbite that happens on your skin. That's to prevent it become bigger and bigger, but you have to bear with the pain. So, of course, how to bear with the pain? I have to eat a lot of painkillers. During that time, probably the expression is only two weeks. So, if you it happens to you on the second day, then you have to bear the rest of the 10 days uh, with uh, painkillers. Were your friends and family quite supportive of your dreams and goals to go to the pole? Oh, yes. They are my uh, hardcore fan. <laughs> when, uh, of course, they were so surprised because when I did this expression first in 2003, nobody knows what my plan was. I was like, it was like a movie. Eh? When I came back from Russia. I was on the, remember I said I was at the World Congress and then everybody like telling me, okay, Sharifa, go to somewhere extreme. Go there and challenge yourself and use this formula and see whether you can succeed or not. Find something difficult. You should know what to do. So on the plane itself, 
I was start thinking, where should I go? Where should I go? And then when I came back, um, <clears throat> I was living in this uh, one apartment with three bedrooms. I was just by myself. Uh, then what I did, one of the room I converted to become my my office, my mini office. So I start doing uh, research. Where should I go? What should I do? What should what kind of challenge that I'm supposed to go through? So then I look at oh, crossing Sahara. No, it's too hot for me. I I don't like hot. Um, I don't I don't think so. I can do that. And then to go uh, swim in the English Channel. I said nah. I don't like swimming. I don't like I don't like um, water. I don't like sea. Then uh, climbing mountains. I I do climb some mountains back here in Malaysia, but um, I'm not so much into climbing mountains. But I just love skiing. So um, then I talked to my friends. I said, "Hey girls, uh, I have few buddies and said, hey, I have these people who challenge me to do something and then test my formula. What do you think I should do?" And then the girls. They know that I love snow so much. They know that I went to Canada because of snow, because I love skiing. And then they tease me, Hey, Sharifa, why don't you go to North Pole? Go and see your Santa Claus. Go and see your, your boyfriend, the Santa Claus. It was just a tease, a teaser by them. But I took it seriously. When I came back, I said, Yeah, why not? Why not? So I started Google. I started looking for companies or organizations who organize trip to Antarctica, trip to North Pole, and all that, I can find all this information. So I, that's why I started to find out about all this. So just imagine my wall in my room normally was like so clean, nothing there, just I hang few pictures. But after like one or two months doing all this research and try to understand, try to set up my mind and try to make a proposal, it end up like the whole wall is full of papers, map, patches, pictures, and <laughs> I just want to psych up myself and say, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Finally, after I have gathered all the information, I make a simple proposal on what I'm supposed to do, which is good to send to my boss. I was working as a lecturer. I think I need to send it to my dean to ask for sabbatical leave in order for me to embark on this expedition. But the first person that I presented the paper was to my mother. So... I call her up. I say, Mom, I want to see you. I have something big to share. So she's from the other state and she came. And I took her for a dinner, nice meal. And after everything is okay, then I say, okay, I have something to tell you. So I explained to her. I showed her the paperwork. And then whatever questions that she asked, she asked about the safety. She asked about what happened if you if you got injuries. How about the evacuation? What if this happened? What is that happened? So many questions and I can answer that clearly. And she said, okay, I can see that you're so confident in what, what you're doing. So I bless you. Go ahead and do it. I hope you will succeed with this mission and don't give up. So she, she become my main supporter throughout my whole journey. And then once I feel the confidence because my mom supported me so much, so... The next step is to go and see my dean. And I presented the same way how I presented to my mom. I strike the deal again very fast. My dean said, wow, fantastic. So we are from Sport Science. We have a lecturers who are going to embark on this. So it is, it's going to be a very good image for the faculty and for the university. So he took me to see my vice chancellor. So I presented the same way. Uh, he was so happy. And I got the I got the sabbatical leave, so that's how I managed to go for this expedition. I got I got paid leave. Yeah, you mentioned at the beginning that um, that you've worked with young women and girls, and I think you went out back to the South Pole in two thousand and nineteen with um, with a few other women. And I'd love for you to share a little bit more about that expedition and how that went. Uh, when I first went to Antarctica in two thousand and four, uh, the first mission to do this, and then. Um, it was like, it became like a, a national mission for Malaysia. So everybody was look, looking up on what I was doing. And what I promised the country is that I just, I don't want to just go for a challenge for my own glory. It's not that. I want this mission to inspire the young ones. So 
I want them to get out from comfort zone. I want them to believe, have a self belief in themselves that you can also be like me. We can actually create more zero to a hero human being here in Malaysia, regardless you're male or female. But I was focusing on more on for the the young ones to inspire them because they are the future generation. So how I did it, like I of course I have a lot of publicity during that time and how to inspire them and how I want them to follow whatever I'm doing. I brought along with me what I call Malaysian time capsule. So in the time capsule, I put a letter and of course I have a letter from the prime minister then. It's a, a, a simple letter to inspire the young ones so that they can continue the legacy, exploring Antarctica, explore, go out there and venture more uh, outstanding expedition, not necessarily to Antarctica itself, to can be to uh, South Pole, North Pole, Greenland or climb Mountain Everest, K2 whatsoever. So I showed them, I said, look, I'm going to plant this. I'm going to leave this capsule in Antarctica. And I want you to go back by 2020 or before 2020. Go and search for this capsule and bring it back. So that's how I have pledged. I have made that promise to my country and to the young ones. I said, girls, you have to go back. I want you to do something about this. So in 2018, after like 14 years, in 2018, I called back my team, my secretary who helped me to organize the expedition, the previous expedition. I called them, uh, we have a chat, we like a uh, reunion and then I said, okay, look, I have this idea. What about my promise back in 2004? I said, I have to bring my protege. I have to inspire someone to go back. Look for the capsule, but the looking for the capsule is just a symbolic. But what what I want them to do is that to inspire them to do something ex, uh, extraordinary. So the whole team like so excited. Hey, yeah, okay, counters in. We want to help you. So, but then this time around we change our module instead of me just doing it alone. We set up an NGO because it's much easier to work as an NGO nowadays. Uh, so. We set up this NGO. I was the president for this NGO. We don't want so many in this group. We only have four of us. Everybody with um, different expertise like IT, uh, social media, uh, marketing. And I also, uh, as a chairman, I also work as the moderator for this, for this NGO to go around and do the press conference and announce this. And then I said, okay, I will do a talent search all over Malaysia. I'm looking for my protege. So the title for this project is looking for the new ice queen. They call me ice queen here in Malaysia. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the I'm the queen. So I say I'm looking for the protege for the ice queen. So I'm going to go all over Malaysia for all the 14 states in Malaysia. But it's also not only for the young ones. I encourage any woman to participate as living healthy lifestyle. They have to go through five challenges, five basic challenges for the first preliminary round, and they get the certificates. So everybody enjoy doing that. So just imagine I got 1,000 qualified candidates for the first round. And the challenges was sit up, push up, lunges, and then a quadrant jump and bleed test for the cardio. Wow, it was like so nice to see that all of, a lot of people came in. We have the youngest, uh, it has to be 18 and above. We have the youngest 18 years old, uh, school leavers. And we have the oldest 62 years old, also, also qualified. That from these 1,000 candidates, we have to shortlist them. That is a lot of work. So they send in their resume, their pictures. So we look for those who have five qualities that similar to my MAPS concept formula. They have to have a mental strength, which is we're looking for education level. At least they have a degree or a diploma because we want them to be able to speak in English or and Malay, definitely. They have to, uh, the mental, emotional, emotional, we want them to be very active in social activities. Emotional and social comes together. We want to see that they are very actively involved in co-curriculum, social activities, uh, clubs, societies and all that. We want to have a physical test. We want to see that they are very active in sports, uh, climbing, running, uh, marathon, 
any kinds of sports as long as they are highly active in sports. And spiritually, is something very subjective. We can only see that once we get together, once we see them, once they are already part of the team, then only we can see how how good they are spiritually. Regardless what religion they are, we want them to believe in God. We want them to be good, be a good human being. Uh, right. So finally, yeah, I I after I did a lot of challenges. I collaborated with so many corporations, gymnasiums, organization, and all that. So we managed to get uh, the top three. So yeah, and then I went with them. And did the last degree in Antarctica. Oh, fantastic. That must have been such an amazing experience and really yeah. opened, their, <laughs> opened their eyes up. Incredible. Sharifa, where's the best place for people to find out more information about you and your different adventures and challenges and your your maps? Where should they go? You can go to https double dot and then slash slash drsharifamazlina.com slash. Yeah, and also they can follow me on my Facebook. Or, uh, I have my personal Facebook, Sharifa Mazlina, and I have my page, Facebook page, which is uh, Sharifa Mazlina, the expeditor, my IG as well. They can follow me on all my activities there. And also now I'm planning for my online motivation program, uh, which we do it for free. I'm going to do it for free for those who less fortunate group to inspire them especially those who lost their jobs, those who are not working at all, those who are in trouble. So I give this kind of talk to inspire them that they can actually change their life if they really want to do something. Don't just sit there and cry and say, oh, uh, I'm doomed. I don't want them to be like that. I want them to use my formula and start doing something for, for a better life. Well, it's really- Thank you so much for coming on Tough Girl Podcast. It's been amazing to speak to you and just best of luck with all of your NCO work and your MEPS concepts. And um, I can't wait to follow along with future challenges and adventures. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Hey Tribe, I hope you enjoyed the episode with Dr. Sharifa. One absolute inspiration, one of the first Muslim and first Malaysian women to spend time in the polls. Just absolutely incredible learning from her. So everything that we have talked about today will be available in the show notes at toughgirlchallenges.com. For those of you who are brand new to the Tough Girl Podcast, my name is Sarah Williams. I'm the host of the Tough Girl Podcast and the founder of Tough Girl Challenges, which is all about motivating and inspiring you while increasing the amount of female role models in the media. New episodes go live every Tuesday and Thursday at 7am UK time and throughout the month of um, September, August and September 2021, there's actually three episodes going live every single week. So Tuesday, Thursday and Saturday. I'm not making a big deal of it on social media, partly because I won't be able to maintain it. So it's just for this sort of very short interim. And that's because I've just got so many incredible women and so many amazing stories that I want to share and get out there. So I hope you're enjoying all of these extra bonus episodes and extra content, whether you are saving them up to binge listen as you head out on an incredible run or an amazing cycle ride, or if you're just pottering in the garden or just lying around at home, wherever you listen to the podcast. Um, you know, I'd love for you to send me a tweet and let show me where you listen to the podcast or send me a picture on Instagram, tag me on Instagram at Tough Girl Challenges. It's always great to hear from listeners and to connect with with listeners. Now, if you are particularly interested in polar exploration, spending time in the cold, I have actually spoken to a number of women in this area from Felicity Aston, who was the first woman to ski alone across Antarctica, a journey of 1,744 kilometers over 59 days. We've spoken to Anne Daniels, who is a record-breaking polar explorer. She's got an incredible story. She had triplets when she first started getting into um, the polar world. We've recently spoken with Rosie Stancer as well. She's an accomplished polar athlete and explorer since 1996. She was described by one journalist as a cross between Tinkerbell and the Terminator. Recently, or a couple of weeks ago, we spoke with Pret Shundi, who's an army psychologist. Um, No, sorry, not a psychologist. He's an army physiotherapist. She's an ultra runner. And she is looking to do the first solo unsupported expedition or looking to do her first solo unsupported expedition to the South Pole. And I'll just share a little bit more about Preet in her own words. So this is what Preet has said. 
I've always been ambitious and enjoyed pushing my boundaries. I had limited knowledge of polar travel when I decided I want to do a solo Antarctic expedition. I wanted to inspire people to believe in themselves. Nobody starts as an expert. Everybody starts as somewhere. You learn as you go on and the more you learn, the closer it brings you to your goal. I started on Google reading about polar expeditions and now I've completed training and expeditions in Norway and Greenland ready for my next step to Antarctica. Um, so, you know, incredible journey. It's going to be amazing to follow along with her. So when we spoke with Preet, she has hasn't been on her solo um, expedition to the South Pole yet. She's still in that training phase. So we discuss more about her reasons, her early life. Um, we talk about the mental resilience and mental grit. She's also done Marathon de Saabs. So it's a really fascinating episode because we talk more about the logistics and the planning and, you know, how to, to get to the stage that she's at in order to take the next step. And we'll obviously be doing a follow-up episode with Preet as well after she comes back from her South Pole challenge, which, fingers crossed, should be happening in the next couple of months in November. So if you haven't followed Preet, then I'd go and give her a follow on Instagram. Her handle is at Polar Preet. So as I say, you know, there's lots of episodes available for you to listen to. If you visit toughgirlchallenges.com, this, that's basically the main central hub. There's more information about me. There's more information about the different challenges that I've done, as well as all of the incredible women that we've had on the podcast. You know, we've had over, there must be over 400 episodes now, probably maybe like more, more like 450, but my numbering is a little bit messed up. So I think if you, the one way to check check it is if you go on iTunes you can actually see all of the episodes coming back and I also do something as well called Tough, Tough Girl Extra which is when I catch up with members of the Tough Girl Tribe my closed Facebook community and I also catch up with previous guests of the Tough Girl podcast so just a couple of the Tough Girl Extra episodes that we've had recently is back in August I shared an episode uh, doing my own sort of personal reflections on the end of 2020 and the start of 2021 Plus, there's more info on the UK Adventure Series, which I'm doing at the moment, which is hashtag Challenge with Cicerone as they are sponsoring the, the Adventure Series. And I also answer questions from patrons and the Tough Girl Tribe. We've also spoken with Vicky Royal as well. She's a passionate runner taking on her first 100k challenge, Race to the Castle. Ellen Pierce has been on, who shares more about leading a double life of adventure and engineering. She's currently in training for an expedition to Svalbard 2022 and is also walking all 25 long distance trails in Cheshire, which is known as the Cheshire Challenge. So a whole host of episodes. I keep saying that. Just go check it out. Visit toughgirlchallenges.com. A massive thank you to all the patrons. If you'd like to support the work that I'm doing, the Tough Girl podcast has inspired you, it's motivated you, if it's changed your life in some way, pay it forward. And one of the best ways that you can do that is by signing up as a patron. You can sign up in euros, sterling, US dollars. There's various tiers from £2 a month, £4 a month, £10 a month, £20 a month, whatever it is that you can afford. It really does make a massive difference to enable me to have this regular source of income coming in to fund the running costs of Tough Girl podcast and for me to be able to earn a living from you know, sharing these incredible stories. More information is at patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash Tough Girl podcast. Please do go and check it out. All that's left for me to say is wherever you are, what, wherever you are, whatever you are doing, give it your all, give it 110%, get after it, go for it. Believe in yourself because I believe in you. Take care, lots of love and I will speak to you soon. Bye.